And again, big internet scam going around, you may have seen, trying to sell you a parcel of an acre of land on the side of the earth that's going to face the moon in a trillion years. Don't fall for that, please. You don't even know for sure which side it's going to be anyway. All right, so when we look at the moon, we see not only the crater surface, but we also see darkish patches. Uh, in historical times, those are actually thought to really be oceans of water. They look sort of ocean-like, and, and the ancients, you know, the Greeks and Chinese astronomers actually thought they might be liquid bodies, liquid filled bodies. Uh, so we have the, the, the Latin terminology, maria, for these thought to be lowlands here, or seas, and uh, highlands called terra, for land. So we have the terra and the maria, the land and the oceans. On, on the moon. Now, you really can't tell without a telescope anything about the true elevation of these features, but it actually does turn out that the highlands really are higher up than the Maria. That's actually true. They're a few kilometers higher up than the Maria. So the idea of having highlands and lowlands actually is accurate, but there's no there's no actual liquid on the surface. And when we look at the features, of course, you see the highlands of the lead features of the Maria, the darker features. You can be this for Halloween, by the way. I won't see you, I promise. And I'm being videotaped. I will not see you if I see you walking around campus. Uh, uh, all right, so of course, the moon being in synchronous orbit around the Earth, what that implies, of course, is that we never see the far side of the moon from the Earth, right? So the far side of the moon was completely unexplored until the 1960s when the first unmanned satellites went into orbit around the moon which are actually precursors to, to the, uh, the manned missions that came later. Now what we see here is an early photo taken from orbit of the far side of the moon. And it's very heavily cratered, but there's actually less Maria. There's some Maria, but there are less Maria than there are on the near side. So this was, a, this was kind of a surprising discovery because the interior was getting pretty much uniform uh, across both sides of the moon, but actually there's more Maria on the near side than on the far side. Very heavily cratered, smaller amount of dark Maria. This led to thinking about the formation history of the moon, which I should say is still a bit of a puzzle. We don't really completely understand where this moon that we've got actually came from, because it happens to be a very massive body for the size of, that we have of the Earth. It's 1 80th the mass of the Earth. That may not sound like much, but if you look at the moons of Jupiter, we talk to factors of 100,000 to a million times less mass in those moons compared to the planet Jupiter. I mean, here, this is 1 80th. I mean, it's, it's you know, up to more than 11 percent of the mass of the Earth. So it's quite a massive object in a very stable circular orbit, too. We don't understand that very well. And one of the first thing, theories about this was that uh, we're seeing Mary on the near side that faces the Earth basically because of the tidal effect that the Earth is exerting on the moon. So just like on the Earth, we have the tidal water bulges that cause us to have two high tides and two low tides every day, uh, the same force that the Earth is exerting on the moon could have created something that would have created kind of an, an inner tidal bulge of molten material, which would have tended to try to pop out on the Earth side instead of on the farther side. So that was an initial theory for why we actually have more Mary on the near side than on the far side. Well, this, this is a, an Apollo astronaut here carrying around something that, for some reason when I first saw that, it reminded me like, of you know, one of my many duties around the house, which is to take care of the cats. And it looked a little bit like uh, a gold-plated scoop, which is my personal income trade. I don't own a gold-plated scoop yet, but I'm hoping eventually. So it's kind of a nightmare that I see. When I see this guy, I think of that giant creature roaming around there in this giant water box. Wake up in a cold sweat. I'm much better. <clears throat> All right. So, despite the fact that I just showed you cats on the moon, actually there aren't any. Um, geologically, well, biologically, it's kind of obvious the moon's going to be dead. There's no atmosphere, no liquid water. There's, there's none of the things that are required for life. I mean, the lack of an atmosphere not only means you don't have oxygen. It also means you don't have protection from cosmic rays, gamma rays, all the things that would tend to, to destroy genetic life as well. So you don't have the protection there. You don't have the atmosphere, you don't have the water. 
But interestingly, it's also geologically dead. In other words, we're not seeing any natural moonquakes or tectonic motion, nothing like that. No volcanoes, no, no evidence for internal geological activity at all. Although there are small moonquakes that are actually caused by impact on the moon of, of small meteorites and, and asteroids. The Apollo astronauts left some very lightweight, rather primitive seismometers on the moon, which were still in radio contact with the Earth for years after the astronauts left the moon. And those were able to uh, detect some of these small moonquakes due to impacts. And based on those, we're able to study the lunar interior just as we're using seismometers on the Earth to study the Earth interior. We'll get back to that in a minute, but I'm going to switch over to Mercury because the part of the theme of this chapter is to compare them a little bit. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Mercury now before we get back to the Moon. Uh, well, first of all, we've already seen on some diagrams of the planetary motions that Mercury's orbit is actually quite elliptical with an eccentricity of 0 0.2. 0 0.2. So uh, if we compare the perihelion and aphelion distances of Mercury from the Sun, we see an average of 0.39 astronomical units, but quite a wide variation, actually about a 20% variation in distance from the sun. So this means that on Mercury, any given point on Mercury is actually going to see quite a large variation in solar heating during the year because of the change in distance from the sun. Now Mercury, of course, always appears near the sun in the sky because it's only about 0.4 astronomical units from the sun. So this is going to have implications for our ability to observe Mercury or using a small telescope or binoculars or anything like that, you're only going to be able to observe Mercury if it's some distance away from the sun in the sky. You can't have it right next to the sun because obviously the sun's going to blind you. You have to make the observations when the sun is down. It either hasn't risen yet or the sun has set already, but Mercury hasn't set. So you want to know how much of a gap in time you might actually have to observe Mercury between, uh, between its rise and the sun's rise or its set and the sunset. And this all comes from a pretty simple diagram that I'm trying to indicate here, where we have the Earth's orbit out of one astronomical unit, and we have Mercury's orbit. And you can see Mercury's orbit is a bit, a bit elliptical there. And what we have here are a couple of angles that we call elongation angles. And they're basically uh, going to tell us what the maximum angular separation we're ever going to see between Mercury and the Sun is. In other words, how many degrees apart in our sky could they possibly be? And then that's actually going to indicate how much time we have to observe Mercury, either before sunset or after, uh, before sunrise or after sunset. Okay, so we see a couple of numbers there, so let me just kind of a little bit more carefully. Next slide here. Alright, so if we look at the maximum distance that Mercury is ever from the Sun, that's the 0.47 astronomical units over here. Uh, here, this is actually the closest approach. Over here, about 0.35 astronomical units. We can calculate this maximum angle of 28 degrees by just drawing triangles, keeping in mind that the distance from the, uh, from the Earth to the Sun is one astronomical unit. So this leg of the triangle right here is one astronomical unit. This leg is like 0.47 astronomical units. And that's a right angle. So it's a right triangle. And we know the base and the height of the right triangle. So we can calculate the actual angle there by just using a tangent in trigonometry. Okay, well, this is just amplifying on the idea. I was just stating that if the sun is about to rise, we'll have a certain amount of time to observe Mercury after Mercury rises and before the sun rises, or if it's the opposite direction, uh, after the sun sets and before Mercury sets. And the greatest elongation we're ever going to have is when Mercury is at aphelion, its farthest distance from the sun, 0.47 astronomical units. Here, Mercury is actually a perihelion. This is considered an unfavorable type of situation because the angle isn't really that large. All right, uh, well, it turns out that the number of hours we can have to observe Mercury either before sun sunrise or after sunset, it's about two hours. And so here we have a parameterization where we have uh, the Earth is going to be spinning here, and this fellow right here is, uh, is seeing Mercury. 
And now, because the Earth has spun a little bit more, the sun has risen. So this is basically two hours. We have Mercury rising at that point, and then two hours later, the sun rises. The sun comes up over the horizon. You can't observe Mercury anymore because it's blinded by the sun. Okay. That's basically what we're all talking about here. So where does this two-hour maximum amount of time actually come from? Well, we have to think about the diurnal rate of motion of objects in the sky. You know, it's pretty, pretty straightforward, really, because anything rising in the east is going to spin around and rise in the east again 24 hours later, right? 24 hour cycle. So if you think about how many degrees per hour objects actually move across the sky, they sweep across the sky, well, any object you know, rising and participating in the diurnal motion is going to cover greater than 60 degrees in 24 hours. So everything moves across the sky at a rate of 360 degrees per 24 hours. If you do the division, you can get the rate per hour to be 15 degrees per hour. So anything, any star moving across the sky moves at a rate of 15 degrees per hour. Now, we already saw that the maximum elongation, which is this maximum angle, Mercury and the Sun is, a, is 28 degrees. So if we think of Mercury and the Sun moving as a unit as they rise above the horizon, if they're moving as a unit, first you have Mercury rise, then you have the Sun rise, and the angle of separation between them is about 28 degrees. But that separation is going to be covered in a certain amount of time by this diurnal motion. Well, the diurnal motion at the rate of 15 degrees per hour and the separation is this so we'll call this maximum, maximum elongation, is 28 degrees. So that 28 degrees is going to be covered by this diurnal motion in about two hours. 28 divided by 15 is about two. So this is where we get that maximum number of hours that we could possibly observe Mercury before we have the sun rising. Now this is completely optimal. Of course, in most cases, an average day, if you walk out in the morning and you want to observe Mercury, uh, well, first of all, you may not even be able to observe it in the morning at all. I might, might have to observe it in the evening. But one way or the other, you're not typically going to get two hours. You're maybe going to get an hour or something like that. This is just, you know, this is an exceptional situation when you actually have mercury at half a during the observation. 